text for our sermon today is from the Holy Gospel, John 6 in particular. Jesus said to them, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not labor for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. The crowd then said, what must we do to be doing the works of God? And Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. And he ends in verse 35 by saying, I am the bread of life. Brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and mercy and peace is yours. From God our Father, through our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I would guess that we all like to eat. Amen? Amen. Mm. You can get to know your pastor here a little bit. I love steaks. I love smoked meats. Seafood, really. Really just any kind of succulent protein is okay with me. I enjoy eggs. I could eat them every morning. Prefer them sunny side up. My favorite vegetable is asparagus with some butter. And there's nothing better in the summer than a homegrown tomato. Sliced. It'll make any sandwich better, but even just by itself with a little bit of mayonnaise, a little salt, some whole wheat bread, that is the definition of a summer delicacy. But above all of them, I love Mexican. It is my favorite food. You can ask the staff that if I eat Mexican, I'm going to be a happy pastor. A steak fajita chimichanga covered with queso, some guacamole, and sour cream. Right, Judy? Right. Some fajitas, some nachos. I love Mexican. But even if I eat Mexican, some five hours later, the feeling is perished. It's almost like it never actually happened. I'm hungry all over again. The feeling has perished. Jesus says in our gospel reading today not to work for food that perishes, food that doesn't last, food that spoils, food that leaves you feeling empty all over again. Now Jesus here isn't talking about real food. The direct reference to the crowd is the, the loaves that they had. But there clearly seems to be a deeper meaning. Do not work for those things, that stuff, that will perish and leave you feeling empty and disappointed. I think in our culture, in our day and age, the word that immediately comes to mind is success. Success. And I think that the idea of success is unique. Because success in and of itself is one of those things that perish, one of those things that we labor for. It's a imaginary idea of being successful. But it's also the sum total of all of the other things, all of the other foods that perish in our day and age. Money, power, fame, sex, relationships, retirement, education, your family, all of those things combine to form this idea of success. In our day and age, the idea of being successful might be determined by how much perishable food you've eaten, how much you've earned. I think that when we look back on our lives, we can fall into the trap of wishing that we'd eaten more spoiled food, even though we know it doesn't satisfy. We wish we'd eaten more. We look back on our lives and regret all of the things we haven't done with them, all of the things we haven't become. Maybe you're in your retirement and you regret that you didn't save more. That all of your friends are traveling. Your friends have a second home down in South Texas where I did my vicarage. All those winter Texans. 
But you didn't save enough to live in the luxury that your friends are enjoying. You can't travel enough. You don't have an RV to go see the country. Your retirement isn't successful enough. Maybe you regret that, that you're not smarter. <laughs> that you didn't go to school. You didn't get that advanced degree. Maybe you opted to stay home with the children, and now you're just wondering if you could have done more. Gotten that piece of paper that says that by the world's standards, you are educated. We wish we'd eaten more spoiled food. We wish we were more successful. We wish our kids were more successful. Because if our children are successful, then we, by definition, are successful. If our children get those degrees, if our children marry the right spouse, if our children make enough money, then we did a good job as parents. And if they don't, then we didn't. We wish we were more successful. That our marriages had been happier. That we'd had more children. That we'd been able to have children, that we made more money, that our houses were bigger, that we would had fancier cars. We want more and more. I think we want more spoiled food. We want more of what we know will probably make us sick, which is kind of like someone with celiac disease craving more bread. <laughs> we think it'll be the remedy, but it just makes it worse. And all of these things that we've turned to throughout our lives, maybe you turn to them now, they really might feel good in the moment. There's no denying that, right? When you get a promotion, when your children graduate with a degree, when you take that trip in your retirement, right? it feels great in the moment. But I think it's a lot like eating at a Chinese buffet. You eat at a Chinese buffet, and it's even worse than the Mexican. Because when you eat at a Chinese buffet, you, 30 minutes later, it's like nothing actually happened. You took three trips to the buffet. You filled your plate three times. But it's like you're starving all over again. Because in our society, whether it's success or the ingredients of success, it will never be enough. Like having a tapeworm. No matter how much you eat, you'll never be satisfied. It's all food that spoils. It's all food that perishes. And Jesus says that. He says, do not labor for that which perishes. And sometimes it hits home for us. Whether it's the circumstances in your life that's finally brought you to your knees. Sometimes it hits home. And we get it. We get it. You're right, Jesus. I, you're right. It won't satisfy. You're absolutely right. But then I think sometimes we're tempted like the crowd. Did you see what the crowd did here? Jesus says, do not labor for the food that perishes. And I think sometimes we do what the crowd did. After he dismisses their original desires for more food that fills the belly, they say, okay, then what must we do to do the works of God? Fine. If all of this earthly stuff doesn't satisfy, let's just change the focus, all right? Let's shift our ideas from earthly success to churchly success. We can get down with that. We can, we can do that. What must we do then to be spiritually successful? What must we do to maximize our piety's potential to have this religious peace? It's just a question of self. What must we do? What must I be doing to have purpose? How much money do I really need to give in the offering plate? How much do I have to volunteer at church? How many worship services do I really need to attend each month to feel better about myself? How often must I pray? How often must I read my Bible? Will it make me feel better? that give me purpose and meaning. The unfortunate thing is that all that religious stuff is still just like a tapeworm. No matter how much of it you do, if you're doing it just to feel good about yourself, if you're doing it to feel spiritually satisfied and spiritually successful, 
It just won't. Switching our efforts, our efforts, from earthly pursuits to churchly pursuits, is like someone with celiac disease switching from a white bagel to whole wheat bread. It might look better on the nutrition facts, but it will still make you sick. If we're being honest, even our spiritual efforts to feel better about ourselves will never be enough. Jesus, at this point in our gospel text, has ripped away every shred of our desperate clingings for purpose. Our earthly endeavors, our churchly endeavors, Jesus dismisses all of them. But he doesn't leave the crowd here disheartened. He doesn't leave them and he doesn't leave you with nothing. Rather here, Jesus gives the key, or you might say the keys to the kingdom. Jesus says to do the work of God, and this is the work of God, the one thing needful. He says, do you believe in him whom he has sent? That's it. Just believe in Jesus. Believe in the one the Father has sent. Believe in the Son who came that all things might be made new. All you have to do is believe. And even that faith, that ability to believe we believe, is a gift. Martin Luther says in my favorite part of the entire small catechism, the explanation of the third article of the creed, that part at the end about the Holy Spirit and the church, he says, I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him. No perishable food that I will ever eat will allow me to believe on my own accord in Jesus of Nazareth. But the Holy Spirit has called me, but called you by the gospel. Enlightened me with his gift, sanctifies us to make holy. He kept me in the faith all of these years. That even faith and belief is not something we do, but something that's done to us. Just believe, Jesus says. Faith, like a life preserver thrown to a drowning saint. You didn't earn the life preserver, you don't deserve it, but it was thrown to you. It was given to you. It was placed in your hands, and all you have to do is hold on. And even your grip strength is the work of the Spirit. Jesus says, just believe. That's all that matters. So much so that in this place and in this family, there is no such thing as more or less successful. In this family, you are not weighed by how much spoiled food you have eaten or earned as you are in the rest of the world. You are not judged by the many works that you have done or not done. You are not judged by your family, by your education, by your most recent promotion, by the size of your house, by your last paycheck. You are not judged by your sobriety or lack thereof. You are not judged at all by your success with spoiled food. There's no such thing as more or less successful in the family of God. There's only the faithful. Only men and women, young and old. Those not who have done the work of God, but those who have had the work of God done to them. God has done the work. The Holy Spirit has given you faith. And all you have to do is believe. Believe in this food and the one who is contained within it. Cling, my friends, to the faith you've been given in this food, here at this altar. That even when all the other perishable food in the world leaves you empty and lonely, there is a food that remains. The bread of life, Jesus says. The cup of salvation and the resurrected one within it. Jesus, who remains with you always.
In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.